It was only uh, three weeks after the Banga campaign that my father found himself again in the midst of action on the adjacent island of Arundel. He went on a patrol with 21 men crossing five miles of Arundel jungle that you see here. A re this was a confused region with isolated and lost Japanese and American units. The objective of the patrol was to get the communications and artillery, to get communications and an artillery observer to one of these units. And incidentally, they failed. The wire they were carrying there ran out before they got to the unit. For an artillery commander to go on such a patrol was unusual at best, if not foolhardy. However, he remembered that he had already lost three of his forward observers and that Heidelberger had been killed exactly a month earlier. He wrote uh, uh, later about this. I hadn't told you before, but it was these three that we had lost that were the reason I went on the patrol in Arundel. Butler was supposed to do it, but that morning I had a hunch I would get through and that he would not. A fourth would have been one too many that day. Anyway, it did work out satisfactorily for me, even though my reputation varies quite a bit on the subject. Opinions range from a dumb stunt to some better comments. Such is Armistice Day here. That's the day he wrote that. After this hair-raising, very cautious, what you might call walk across a rundle, they joined an understrength American battalion, which was isolated and low in ammunition. Uh, led by Colonel William Naylor. After a couple of fierce firefights, the, most fe the, the hottest he'd been in, they made it to safety, joining a completely different regiment, the 27th, in Bombo Village. From the command post that you can barely see here, the tent through the trees to the right of the little house, he directed artillery day and night against the Japanese troops and boats boats that were running back and forth reinforcing or evacuating Japanese. It was highly unusual to use boats against, to use artillery against boats and moving targets. His observers on the little islets were so close to the Japanese they had to whisper into their telephones. As he wrote, we fired at boats when they came out of coves, when they passed points, and when they tried to hide in the Villa River, when they went to Devil's Island, and then gave them our barrages when they tried to land in Sagacarasa. I'll never forget my whispering chorus of observers. They would get excited and tell me to hurry, hurry, and I'd say, it'll leave when we get shifted. The shell will leave when the gun is shifted. And don't forget the cannoneers do the work. We just see the results or some other comment. comment. His artillery killed the Japanese regimental commander, and he was very aware of this, and that was a real sentimental or moving point in the Japanese history, too. At this village, Bombo, in the shadow, almost, of the adjacent volcanic island of Kolombangara, which you see here, I met two of the natives, the older two gentlemen in this picture, who were rescuers of John Kennedy, whose PT boat was run down by a Japanese destroyer a month earlier on the straits you just saw in the previous picture. One of, the, and one of these days while my father was there in September 43, in this command post directing artillery, as preparations were being, being made for an American attack, three eminent personages walked into the command post, complete with reporters, colonels, photographers, and a lot of fuss. They were, and here you see them that week in a PT boat, Admiral Halsey, General uh, Griswold, the Corps commander, and young, sent the young senator from Massachusetts, a senator even then, Henry Cabot Lodge. They sat around with the colonel chatting and drinking spiked orange juice while my father's artillery preparations made suitable battlefield sounds. My father was not part of the party. He said majors were just like corporals. Though the guest did sit on his cot and he did chat with Lodge, thinking he was a newspaper reporter at the time. And I did call Lodge, he's now dead, and he remembered the v riding that PT boat ride. He did not remember that particular visit uh, to that tent. But his notes clearly, in his, in his notes, which I read, uh, he describes what he learned there, though he doesn't mention talking to a field artillery officer. 
In the daytime, my father would take a boat with Colonel Sugg down to a beautiful lagoon to watch an American attack carried out with six marine tanks that had been brought in by boat and quietly, can you imagine it, quietly brought up to the front lines to surprise the Japanese. The tank, he wrote, as they watched that tank attack, the tanks moved out with their machine guns and canister firing. All of the machine guns in our line started mowing down the bushes ahead of them and Tommy guns, auto rifles, and M1 rifles started searching for Japs. Our men ignore the tanks and fire at and around where they are because the Marines inside the tank are safe and fire close to them. And, f and fire, machine gun fire, close to them, protects the tanks from, my from any Jap trying to slip or throw mines under them. Of course, the Japs also opened, a opened up with everything they had, and there was some pretty heavy fire going both ways for a few minutes. We were pinned down for this period on the edge of the road, but in no particular danger. Since a lot of fire was coming against us from one flank, Sugg decided to bring up some extras. He was the infantry commander, regimental commander. So we ran back to his supply dump where he grabbed all men with rifles and started them forward. Just then, word came back that everything was under control. So we went back up front. He didn't mention his lack of confidence to his battalion commander either. I didn't tell. This attack was successful. Several hundred yards were gained. Two days later, another attack with two tanks led to led to one of the tanks being destroyed by a Japanese anti-tank gun. When I was in Japan, I met Colonel Kinoshita, who was the battalion commanding officer on the receiving end of those attacks. He told me how surprised and defenseless they were against the first attack, but how with great difficulty they got the regiment's only anti-tank gun in position, that they had only 10 shells and did destroy one tank and damage the other. He said, I myself stood beside that gun as it fired. We were in a desperate situation. I had thought my days were numbered. My men were greatly cheered by our success. When I was in Bombo village, I was told that a tank was back in the jungle. Having previously read and heard all of these accounts, I was eager to see it. We went by canoe several miles down the coast of Arundel through a beautiful channel and chopped our way with a machete through about 100 meters of jungle. Sure enough, there it was, looking very fit with hatches that open, rubber on its treads, and five neat shell holes low down on its front. The tragedy of that moment became apparent to me. The shell holes were right where the driver sits. Also, the expenditure of five or six shells out of the Japanese last ten showed the anxiety of the gun crew. The encouraged Japanese then attacked the American lines in a senseless charge that cost them many lives. The friends took these photographs later because my camera had been damaged when I dropped it in the water and was no longer working when I was here. On September 21st, one week after the five-mile patrol, the, the Japanese evacuated Arundel, withdraw, withdrawing to Kolomengara. This ended active combat for the 43rd Division for another nine months. Before leaving Arundel, a photograph was taken of my dad and two of his other officers, Bailey and Ryan, to commemorate their experiences on Arundel and dad's and Bailey's promotions, from dad to lieutenant colonel, appropriate for the battalion command he had held these past months. He returned to his unit on the mainland in New, of New Georgia on a peninsula called Ondaga, Ondanga. Administrative and personnel matters, health and training were attended to. He captioned this photo, what a well-dressed artilleryman wears, though I know he also carried a pistol around. I find myself very interested in the ordinary non-combat life. What was living like? Because they spent most of their time not fighting. How did the time get occupied? They sat at this Ondanga for four months. What was living like? What, they were doing lots of training, but my dad's letters, as descriptive as they were, didn't substitute for photographs. Just a few months ago, I was fortunate to locate a treasure trove of labeled negatives in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, taken from this period in Ondanga. They were taken by the late, uh, by the deceased Dr. Charles Devonzo, who was the medical doctor with my father's units. So here is the signpost 
which tells the dead direction to the different parts of the unit. You'll notice the top two or three signs point to Cranston, Rhode Island, and South Providence. And then in this one, you see officers, the officers having their photographs taken in front of the brand new chapel they built. Here is my father in his tent doing his administrative work. I'd often wondered how he did his administrative work. Uh, here you see vehicles lined up for an inspection. He had written how they did inspections, how the vehicles were all lined up and painted up and maintained so when the big brass came up for the inspection, they would be suitably impressed and how they had the, the drivers were going to call off, ready for inspection down the line sequentially, so you'd hear it echoing down the line in an unconventional, dramatic presentation for inspection that, as I would say, he said something similar, would knock the socks off the generals. And here is a picture of that very inspection my dad wrote of. Here's a band concert with my dad's tent in the background with him and Dubois sitting barely visible in the tent watching the band concert. You can see a bass fiddle sort of in the middle there. And off to the right, just past, uh, to the right of the bass fiddle, a, uh, an underground shelter because they were shelled by artillery a bit the first month there. Here's Dr. Devanzo and my father. And then the promotion party for my father. You see him in the f with his back to the camera and then you see him smiling at the end of the table. These are the officers that carried the 169th Field Artillery Battalion through that Solomon Islands combat. Back home on October 29th, just a few weeks after this party, my mother delivered a baby, Abigail, born in Washington, D.C. Valerie and I were in the fall term of our year in boarding schools in New Jersey. We. Uh, remained there until the following summer. Mother was busy caring for the baby, but she continued to write Dad. However, the few months after the birth, the letters were less frequent and clearly devoid of the little details of her life because she couldn't tell them. He sensed she was having problems. He was worried and angry and complained. And when she protested about his complaints, finally, he finally became resigned. He came to believe she was involved in some kind of war work she couldn't talk about and realized he had to continue his courtship by mail which he could, in fact, do so well. Some of his anguish is apparent in the letters. I have often wondered why you keep your residence from me. It's been five months almost, and I have written repeatedly. He was writing to a post office box in Baltimore, asking about you personally, what you do, where you go, and how you spend your time. I don't expect to know what you are doing, for you have said it required some secrecy. Of course, I can understand that. However, I cannot understand why you have apparently lost all interest in your music and writing, or perhaps you think I'm not interested. Dearest wife, don't mistake my words for my thoughts and intentions. That one important thing is my love for you. All the things I say poorly or fail to say are still an effort at the expression of my love for you. You are having a hard time there, and I realize it is harder for you than for me. That's also true, because she had to worry about the children and schooling, her pregnancy, the home back in Bangor getting rented, and all the thousands of details of life that in a way, when you're off fighting, you don't have to worry about. You have one big worry, if I can belittle the fighting slightly. In a way, she was the heroine in my book. He goes on, I was at home too much during the last war, during much of the last war, so I know how hard it is. You don't want to be home. You don't want to worry me. I know and I appreciate that. From now on, I won't say anything about these things. You can write as often or as seldom as your situation requires, and I will understand that, and it is okay. If there is a reason why I should be told so little about you, that too is all right. I will be sure you are doing what your judgment requires. I do hope you can be doing the things you want to do, and that it won't keep you away from your music too long. Gradually, the supportive letters from Mother resumed their earlier frequency, as did the steady stream of packages she, he was of material, he can, like, for instance, canned oysters, which he was continually requesting of her, batteries for his battery radio. He went on in his letters with lots of miscellaneous news, including, in the same letter, including a humorous one. And one of the published orders by higher headquarters was the following. It has been observed that flies are prevalent around latrines and kitchens. The kitchen flies often go to the kitchen 
the latrine flies often go to the kitchen and the kitchen flies to the latrines and vice versa. Correct, corrective action will be taken immediately. This isn't an exact quotation, but it's no worse than the exact one. Since then, one of the local newsletters came out protesting the injustice of such an order and pointing out, out that some of the kitchen flies do go to the, to the latrine for pleasure, but that some have to go. And further, that the latrine flies certainly were reasonable in making their trips to the kitchen at mealtime. Morale is up 10 points. <laughs> In February 1944, they finally left New Georgia to return to New Zealand for more training. This was a full year after leaving Western civilization in New Caledonia. On the way, they spent a few days in Guadalcanal where it rained a lot. That's water on the floor, you see. During the four months in New Zealand, they enjoyed the gracious hospitality of the farm community of Matacana. Many home-cooked meals for men and officers alike. He remembered them warmly, and in 1984, I found that the Kiwis, New Zealanders, still remember him warmly, those people that he knew. In June 1944, preparing to leave, they took the ritualistic pre-combat photographs. They left Auckland Harbor en route for New Guinea in July 7th. That day, he wrote Mother, of the many friends who had befriended him and his, <clears throat> befriended him and his men, suggesting she write them in write them thank you notes. Toward the end, he rather self-consciously wrote of a Miss Olive Madsen whom he had met while on a three-week uh, bus and train trip around New Zealand, which he took with Captain Davis. There was only one other letter, and it isn't so important. That would be to Miss Olive Madsen of Wairapa, New Zealand. That isn't the complete address, but I think it's okay. If I find the rest of the address after we reach my trunk, I'll correct this. She and her mother I've mentioned before as part of my vacation contacts. I met them on the boat going to Christchurch, New Zealand from Wellington and liked them. I found she was taking her mother on a vacation, the main purpose of which seemed to be to meet some New Zealand aviator. On one of his duty nights, I took her to a movie and then on my return to Wellington ten days later, we, Davis and I, the officer he was traveling with, were invited out to their farm. We couldn't go, so the daughter came into town and spent the day with us. In fact, she nearly walked me to death. That was that, and okay, but I never saw the farm. I met Olive Madsen. She, had, she was a gracious, lively person of 79. She had never married. She had been a florist, age 29, at that time. My father was 44. The encounter was a bit romantic, but not physical. They were like two ships passing in the nighttime of war. It is now summertime 1944 in America. Valerie and I have finished our year in New Jersey boarding schools. I was 13 and she 12. Mother retrieves us from boarding school and moves us and moved us to our home, old home in Bangor that we had left more than three years earlier. She left the baby Abigail with the baby's natural father in Washington, D.C. The university and military associates and families of my father were in Bangor. It appears she had resolved to re-enter the straight and narrow, proper life, even if she had to give up her baby. It was terribly difficult for her. Valerie and I had no idea this baby even existed, nor did Dad, as his letters clearly indicate. She told me that when Val and I were out of the house, she would look at a wall painting of the baby Jesus and cry her eyes out. She was very religious. She did visit Washington, D.C. and the baby a few times during that year. 